Welcome, everybody, to the Kona Shame Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I got a good one for you today. I am here with my friend, Dr. Shelly Adrian. She is uh, she is a veterinarian. She is a member of Uncharted, which is how I got to know her. Uh, she is also the U.S. Ambassador for the Purina Institute. And uh, I am talking to her about a case that you have seen. Yes, you have. It's the young Labrador who is not wildly overweight yet, but we're seeing it creep up. In this case, we're talking about Charlie, the two-year-old Labrador Retriever, whose weight has crept from 76 to 84 pounds, and whose owners kind of don't seem super motivated to get involved with it. They're kind of like, oh, Charlie loves, Charlie loves food. Listen, uh, this is about team training is what it is. It's about communicating effectively. It is about uh, supporting our team as they have these conversations. It's about the pet owners getting these, uh, the same story and resources to back that story up from multiple team members. And so guys, Shelly is amazing at this. Really good conversation about how to approach this super common case. And let's be honest, super important, right? We know that we expand pets' lifespans when we manage their weight. How do we do it? And, uh, and the resources that Shelly brings to the table really fantastic if you want your team to do better jobs talking about nutrition this is a great episode to get into and to share with them guys uh without further ado we're going to jump into this episode which has been brought to you ad free by the purina institute let's get into it this is your show we're glad you're here we want to help you in your veterinary career Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Shelley Adrian. Thank you, for, thanks you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Andy. It's my it's my pleasure. Um, you and I have known each other for years. Uh, you are uh, an Uncharted member, and so that's where uh, we met back uh, back in the day, hanging out at those conferences. And I've always enjoyed you very much, and uh, I love to see you. Uh, at our at our gatherings and our get together, you are a practicing vet in San Diego, and you are also the U.S. ambassador for the Purina Institute. And I bring that up because it's sort of central to the conversation that I want to have with you today. Um, when we last spoke, you were telling me about one of your cases, um, and we were sort of talking about the hard conversation of getting pets to actually lose weight. I um, had a case yesterday and it was a 10 year old Yorkshire Terrier uh, with collapsing trachea and it came in and the owners were super nice. They're, they're really great people, but they came in and they're like, the medications aren't working anymore. You know, I've been trying to sort of me medically manage this case and you know, the medications aren't working anymore. Um, and, and he's just coughing all the time or whatever. And that little booger had gained a pound since the last time I saw him. And he's, he's only 10 pounds now. So even from nine to 10 pounds, and they're like, I don't, you know, he's coughing all the time. And I'm like, yeah, I, I suspect so. And I, I know I talked with them away about weight management and stuff before. And um, I went through like, what do you, you know, what are you feeding? And it was this, it, again, they're wonderful people and they clearly love this dog. But the list of things that they feed to this dog just kept going, you know, and it kept going and there were pates and there were extra <laughs> There were, there were, there were, there were things that they were cooking and, and there were just these things. And I'm like, this is a hard conversation. And it was a hard conversation, even though I'm like, there's, here's this glaring medical issue, right? Like, it's like, it's not like, Hey, it would be good if he lost weight. It's like, no, you came here because he's, because he's coughing and this is getting worse. And I'm like, we have got a, a pressing medical reason for him to lose weight. And that's still a hard conversation. And so, so, so that was just yesterday that I, that I had that happen. And then I step back and I really look at like what we do for pets and what matters for pets. And, and when we think about the things that really affect the life of our, of our patients, the two biggest ones in my mind are weight, weight management, nutrition, and, and dental health, right? Like if you think about, I, I, if the goal for me is to increase the life span of the patients that I see, like those are, those are the ones I want to get right. And the last thing I'll sort of pull into this is the classic golden retriever study of, you know, dogs that are of an ideal body weight or slightly thinner live on average two years longer than those that are even slightly overweight. And so we know the importance of this conversation, 
but it is really hard to get traction on this conversation. I know that people have a lot of frustration with this. So anyway, go go back to our conversation and you and I were talking and uh, you brought up, you were talking about the Pyrenean Peer, Institute, you were talking about resources that were there and then and you kind of had a, a case of, of how you would kind of put those resources into use. And, and I want to kind of unpack that with you today if you're okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. And that nutrition conversation is vital, right? Nutrition yeah. is considered the, the fifth vital assessment. We know we have to have that conversation. We know our owners want to have that conversation with us. But yeah. regardless of whether it's a weight topic or what they're currently feeding topic, it can feel very difficult and, and delicate and uncomfortable for us to have that conversation. Yeah. Well, there's there's a couple pieces to it, right? Like there's the denial piece when they, like I'll never forget, I saw the most morbidly obese pet I've ever seen in my entire career. And I showed the pet owners the body condition score chart. And I was like, which one do you think your dog is? And they pointed right at five out of nine. And I was like, <laughs> which dog are you looking at? Um, <laughs> I would and, say it's but, a know, nine plus out of nine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was just like there there is that like there is that sort of denial, the, the denial part of it. And then there then there's sort of the, the food is love part of it. Like they have to they have to believe that this is worth it. Um, you know, or it's just so easy to fall off the wagon. So that that's it's such a struggle. But um so so yeah, let me let me let me go ahead and kind of open this sort of up for you a little bit. Why don't, why don't you just, why don't you tell the story? Why don't you tell, tell, tell me again the story uh, that you were telling me before about sort of the two-year-old Labrador. Yeah. You know, luckily I, I saw this patient before it was in the situation that your Yorkie was in the other day, but yeah. very classic patient that we see. I saw her in June of 2021. Um, for the one moment we were allowing clients in the exam rooms. Uh, yeah. Charlie, two-year-old, female spayed Labrador was just there for healthy pet, no concerns, vaccines, really was a no concerns vaccines, uh, except I had a concern. When she came in, she weighed 84 pounds, um, and previously she had weighed 76 pounds. Um, and the owner, again, sort of the denial part, right? The owner didn't realize that those extra pounds can slip on you over six months. Yeah. I think we've all experienced that. So I had to bring up a, a topic that the owner wasn't prepared to talk about uh, and and draw her attention to a problem that she wasn't aware Charlie had. So yeah. I was able to, to use this new resource, this online toolkit that's available to us uh, from the Purina Institute. And I had some secret knowledge of this toolkit. Uh, and what I was able to do was pull up a video for the owner on how to conduct a body condition assessment on your own pet. And while I went to go get Charlie's vaccines and vaccinate her, I was able to play that video in the exam room for Charlie's owner to watch. And then when I came back, we talked about what did she think Charlie's body condition score was. Now being a typical owner, after watching the video, she thought Charlie was a five out of nine. Yeah, uh, seven out of nine. <laughs> nine. Typical, right? Yeah. But... Um, on that same website, instead of having to open up a completely new tab and go to a new resource, I was able to pull up the body condition score chart and talk with her about what I was looking at when I'm judging Charlie's body condition and showed her why instead of a five, I would actually grade Charlie at a six. And you're right. I was able then very quickly to link to a resource that talks about that retriever study. And it was perfect because Charlie is a retriever. And what yeah. they found was that, you know, paired litter mates who were just slightly heavier. Uh, typically those dogs were a six and a half out of nine versus four and a half out of nine. Lived two years shorter than their lean litter mates. So we had that conversation. We talked about Charlie's ideal body weight and body condition. And I was able to print out a body condition score chart to send home with Charlie's mom. I was able to print out a brief, uh, or actually I emailed it to her after the, the exam. And it kind of went through those key bullet points of like why it's important to have my pet at a, an ideal body condition. And most importantly, to help me feel comfortable having this conversation, it links published data. So this is not just Dr. Shelley Adrian saying this, this isn't just random veterinarian saying this, this is based on scientific data. Um, not mentioning any type of specific product or, or biased in any way, it's just based on scientific data. And then the, the cool part is I just saw Charlie again uh, six months later. And guess who's back down to her original body weight? So how often does it happen where that weight conversation works the first time? 
Yeah, you like you won. Like you actually you actually did the thing and got got the pounds back off as opposed to, you know, all the other cases where you see the two year old and they've gained six pounds. And the next time you see them, they've gained another pound and then three more pounds. And now they're 93 pounds. And that's where they're just going to kind of live for a while. I mean, yeah, you actually you actually move the needle. I, w- I want to unpack with you a little bit workflow, right? And so one of the things I think a lot about these days is is how we do education and how we do education in a way that actually reaches people. Uh, some of the pushback that, that I get, because I, t- I teach a lot about exam room communication and how we build relationship and how we build trust. People are always talking to me about time, like time, time, time. You know, Andy, I, we're super busy. We've got people waiting. We've got all of these things. And it's just, it's so easy to push nutrition off of your plate and just say, this is, this is not the most pressing thing. They didn't ask me about nutrition. You know what I mean? We can talk about it next time because the dog is still going to be a little bit heavy then and we can do it then. And, and you know, I, I want to be gentle and, and kind to my colleagues and, and I'm standing in the exam room. And I, I, I run behind the schedule as well. I'm like, I, I know, I know how it goes at, at the same time when people press me on it and say, well, what do we do? What do we do? I really love the idea of using videos and using uh, resources and things that we have in the clinic to, to let clients work or educate or to support the things that we're saying when we're not in the exam room. And so as you say, hey, I, I ducked off to do these other things and I showed them this video and when I came back, we talked more. I go, man, that is that is multitasking, right? That's an efficient use of time is I'm going to I'm going to hand you this while I go get these other things going. And you're going to stay engaged and, and we're going to advance this conversation while I'm in the back drawing up vaccine, setting up fecals, you know, uh, getting my next appointment ready, whatever the, the things that I'm doing. Help me, walk me through that workflow. Like, what exactly does that look like? Are you using, are you using tablet computers? Like, I, I just, just, uh, again, I, I just want to start at the base level. I think, I think, I think I and other people really just want to visualize what the system looks like to, to get this education into the sessions. That's a great question. And, and I'm just like you, um, I'm almost always running behind in the clinic. Uh, There's so much information I want to convey to the owners, and we have such a short period of time with them. And it's all critical, right? Um, And I would argue you're absolutely right that that some of the most overlooked conversations are some of the most important. And dental disease and nutrition are the top two because all of our patients have to eat. uh, And all of our patients at one time had teeth. Uh, so it's really right. important that we never leave those pieces out. As far as workflow goes, it can vary from clinic to clinic. The way my clinic works, we do have computers in the exam room that that I can use. Um, we could use a tablet if we chose to. Um, on that that same resource, that online toolkit, I can email things. And I did email something after the fact. It was really easy to just kind of click a link and send that email yeah. to the owner. Um, <clears throat> there are even... Uh, additional resources that I could use to train my staff with videos or with reading. So the the workflow, again, idea to save us time, to get us quick information. You know, it, when we're in the exam room too, what I find as a barrier sometimes with nutrition conversations is when we look up good science-backed conversation, we pull up some sort of, you know, 12-page document that might take us yeah. an hour to read, Right. And sometimes I just need the quick key messages. I just want the bullet points. What do I need to say? What is the most important information to convey in less than five minutes? Uh, And so Mm. the the nice addition to this tool is it every piece of content has a read or watch time. So I can even filter if I've got less than five minutes, what can I use to convey this, this information and go. That's super cool. Yeah, we need to be realistic about what people are going to actually do. You know what I mean? Like sending them home with a multi-chapter reading assignment is wishful thinking. I mean, it's just, I mean, imagine, you know, I, I, I liken, um, I liken what we do to auto mechanics sometimes. And, I, and not, not in all cases, I know people don't like that. But for me, I, um, it's the easiest thing that I can imagine that is kind of expensive. Um, it can get expensive real fast. And I personally, I'm not a car guy. I I don't I don't know all that much. I I want to be a good car owner. Obviously, I want to have a car that works and have a nice long life from a car. Um, and and I don't know what I need, and I don't know what I don't know. And so f- when I think about education, I think a lot about like my experience with it with an auto mechanic and stuff like that. And if I go to the auto mechanic and they give me a ten page document to read, you know, with the specs of engine care, I it's not going to happen. And you know, it's not going to happen. I mean, you know, you and I were talking before. Uh, as we're making this COVID pandemic spike, my kids have been doing virtual school for a while. Uh, everybody around me is sick. Uh, yeah, and it's sort of like, man, we're all busy. 
Uh, and we're all stressed. And so just meeting people where they are and being realistic and just giving them the actual information that they're going to use to make a decision and then giving the pathway to where they can go deeper if they want, right? I think that's probably the key with with a lot of the clients and trying to educate is we all have those clients who are sponges. Like they want, they want to read all the things. They want the 12 page document and they want to see the original sources. Like it's a beautiful thing to be able to give people the executive summary and then have it link deeper, or have them have the ability to go deeper to kind of what what they want. But I think a lot of times we jump to the to the to the full to the full Monty, and people are not ready for that. And uh, and it just it it goes into their email, and it just sits it's it sits in their inbox for a long time because they didn't delete it because they mean to read it, they just never do. And so I, I that's that's super uh, that's super interesting to me to sort my time and to have stuff that's that's top level. I want, um, can I ask you some more questions about the about the training stuff? Because that's really intriguing. Like I, I'm a super big advocate for for tech training, uh, for helping people grow and develop inside the practices. I like people to be learning new things. I want to learn new things, and so I'm always interested in what kind of training resources and stuff are there. Can you can you lay out what's there and like what might be beneficial to practices? I thought that might pique your interest. Um, yeah, yeah, and, I love it. <clears throat> it's and, and that's the the neat thing, you know. Um, like you said, some folks want those key bullet points, those key messages, and that's all they need to know. I don't know what a carburetor is. I'm never going to read further about what a carburetor is. I just hope that it works. Um, but sometimes I, I really do want to read deeper into what makes a large breed puppy mm-hmm. food different than a regular puppy food, right? And so do my technicians, sure. because let's be honest, they might be the ones having the conversation about large breed puppy food versus regular puppy food. Um, so what we can utilize on that center square toolkit there are videos, there are write-ups, again, with those key bullet points, but then linking to deeper, um, more science, uh, getting into that nitty-gritty, that nerdy part, um, and again, always mm-hmm. based on published data. The videos are really cool, though, and I pull those up frequently for just for myself. If I have a few minutes to inhale my lunch, most of the videos are less than five minutes long, and they're recorded by board-certified veterinary nutritionists. Um, these are nutritionists that do not work for Purina. So this is not Purina centric at all. Um, and they have all kinds of really helpful videos about how to fit that nutrition conversation into a short exam, how to have a conversation with an owner who comes in with um, recommendations for foods, perhaps from a breeder or a shelter that maybe we don't agree with those recommendations for that pet. Um, the importance of a nutrition conversation. They hit all of those difficult topics and give their pearls and their best practices because they're having those conversations too, right? So listening to yeah. their perspective on it, just while I'm inhaling my food, watching that quick video is, is not only helpful for me, but for my staff as well. And then if they want to dig deeper, they can uh, look below the video and it will link them to some of the deeper uh, information on that same topic. That's that's awesome. I I really like it a lot. Can you help me with so it's the last part of this for me that that I I find as a hurdle to to really leveraging resources effectively is what I say in the exam room. Help. Uh, can you help me with some conversation stuff just to just to set this up to then refer them to some resources and things like that. Uh, you have a lot of experience with this. How do you broach the conversation of either Hey, I'm going to leave you with this video or uh, I want to send you. I want to send you with more information, and I'm going to send this as a link, or I'm going to print this off. I, like, what, what, what strategically do you do to set up the conversation so it doesn't sound like, "Hey, I know we didn't talk about this, but here's a bunch of links," uh, because that's that's not going to go anywhere either way. So you you're naturally a very warm and charismatic person. How do you lead into this conversation to get people to to actually click the links and 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 to feel like, yes, this is not homework for me. This is a, a value add to my exam visit. That's a good question. And you're right. We, we don't want to information dump or, or sometimes we do want to information dump, but we know that that's not effective. <laughs> right. Always want to, always want to information dump. Uh. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I think a part of it is going back to the, the idea that we're on the same team. We yeah. both want what's best for, for their pet's health. And going back to the idea that food is love, I almost find nutrition to be a topic that usually does pique owner's interests. And as opposed to my car's carburetor, that yeah. the nutrition piece is something they want to read. So when I bring up the nutrition conversation, which I always at least mention a piece of nutrition in the exam room, we always yep. talk about what food they're currently eating, the body condition score. So as I go back to that, hey, remember we talked about 
you know, your dog is eating X, Y, Z. Um, the reason I like X, Y, Z food for Fluffy is, and then if you want to read more uh, up on that, you know, say, for example, I'm seeing a geriatric cat. Uh, this is another true, true life example, a geriatric cat named Angelina, 17 years old, um, who is who is healthy, but she was getting to that where, you know, she's getting leaner and thinner mm -hmm. and, and losing that lean body mass. So we talked about the food she was eating, which was good. Um, but what I said for her is, hey, I want to focus a little bit more on getting more water into her, uh, help mm -hmm. with her kidney function uh, and just for geriatric cat in general and getting some extra protein into her for that lean body mass. So if you want to read further on why I'm making that recommendation, I have this link for you. In the meantime, here are some solutions as far as getting more water into her and getting more protein into her. Does I like that, that a lot. If, yeah, I like that a lot. Of of hey, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to get deeper into why I'm making this recommendation, I that's the words that I like. Yeah, okay, I am gonna I'm gonna put that into my little uh, quiver of arrows for the exam room because that that makes that makes sense for me uh, as well. So no, I, I like that a lot. That's um that's that that's that's that really makes sense. You know, one of the things I think is true with with nutrition, right? I. I think um, I think it's true of people in general, but I think it's also especially true of people with pets. I think we all want to have control in our lives. You know, I mean, I think we all want to believe that we have some control. And we want to believe that we can keep ourselves. And I think this is obviously COVID thoughts with Andy. You know, we all want to believe that we can keep ourselves and our family safe, uh, including our, our 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 pets. And nutrition is a thing that we have great control over for our pets. You know what I mean? Like it is a thing where we can make this purchase and we can decide what, what they get. And this is an aspect of their life that we can control, which is why people talk to us about their pet stool all the time. Cause they're like, they can see it and it's there and I can adjust what's going in the front side and uh, affect what's going on the back side. And this is control I definitely have. And so I, I do think that, that in that mindset, nutrition is really easy to talk about. And I do find that pet owners are generally psyched to, to, to get a recommendation and start to wade into it. There's also some research that came out, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to quote the stats because they'll, they'll, be, they'll be off, but I was actually kind of surprised by the high percentage of pet owners who say that they want nutritional recommendations from the doctors and they want to talk about nutrition. I think a lot of us go, they, they've got, they made a choice, and this is bringing up old stuff, but the research says that that's not true. You're right, um, and, and I'm a super nerd. I actually do know this stuff. <laughs> So I, thought, I, I was like, I'm going to toss this out there half baked, and I'm going to yeah. let Shelly just finish cooking it for me. You know, and I think it's really important for us to keep this in mind because, again, I'm I'm in San Diego. I have had the challenging nutrition conversations, and I know what it's like oh, when sure, you're yeah. talking and you feel like you're talking to a brick wall. Um, but they hear you. They hear you. 83% uh, of owners trust their veterinary professional when it comes to nutrition advice. However less than 25% perceive that they're getting that nutrition conversation when they go to the vet. So it's real. That's why yeah. I think it's important to have those additional resources and say, Hey, if you want to read more, because if they have those, whether it's an email or a video we showed them or a printout that we leave them going home with, now they know they've had that nutrition conversation, right? So now they're, they're going to see, yes, I got this recommendation from my vet, whether it was about body condition score, specific diet, hydration, whatever the aspect of nutrition, the conversation you had, they know they had that conversation with you. And that just builds to a better relationship overall, right? Yeah, I agree. I want to leave you with a, a bonus round here. And you can take either of these two questions. You can either leave me with your favorite pearl for uh, getting nutritional compliance, getting people on board, getting people to make changes that you think that most GPs and or technicians miss, or you can give me the biggest pitfall that you see in these conversations that most of us fall into. Ooh. Which one do you want to do? I know, either, you, can take, you can take either one. Yeah, I know. You know, I think the biggest pitfall that I see from my colleagues is shying away from the nutrition conversation. And I, there are lots of reasons why, right? We might not feel comfortable having it. We might not be fully... Yeah up on the science ourselves, right? So if we, if we get questioned, we're not sure that we can justify the recommendation we're giving um, <clears throat> or we don't know how to have that conversation. But I, I challenge you to take the conversation back because as we already discussed, the owners want it. 
if they don't get the information from their vet professional, they're going to get it from somewhere. And yeah. we have tools available to us that are backed by science. So if you take a step back and you just approach it as a teammate with the owner, right? We're part of a team to keep this pet healthy. And what does the published data say about this pet's nutrition? And if we just go back yeah. to what our resources and our published data give us, it can take some of the emotion out of it and it makes it less difficult. So I, I challenge you, especially those times where you really don't want to have the conversation, do it. Have the conversation backed by science. Give a specific diet recommendation every time. Whether it's stay on this food, it's great, I love it. Or I recommend X diet because this is Y. And yeah. back up, you know, cite your source, back up your reasoning. Yeah. We're, uh, what's the easiest way or the best way for people to engage with Purina Institute and Center Square? I'm going to put links in the show notes for everybody who wants to click through. But yeah, if, if people are out there and they're listening to this as they drive in and they're like, hey, I want to I want to look around. I want to see this thing. Uh, how would you advise them to get started? Perfect. Yeah. The Purina Institute is the, the scientific arm of Purina. Uh, and, and the goal of the Purina Institute is is twofold. In general, is to, to generate and communicate scientific content on companion mm. animal nutrition, but also to help us take that conversation back, to help us have these difficult nutrition conversations. So if you just go to the, the website, purinainstitute.com, there's a wealth of information there. If you want to get real nerdy on it, you can, whatever the topic may be. But there's, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the nerdy shell, you had to come out. <laughs> um, but Love there it. is a, a label at the top called Center Square. And if you just tap on that, you can search the, the wealth of resources. I encourage you to play with it, whether it's veterinarian, technician, receptionist. There's content there that can help you have those nutrition conversations because we all do. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate you. Appreciate your time. Thanks for the Sandy. And that is our episode. Thanks again to the Purin Institute for making this possible, guys. Thank you for tuning in and checking it out. As always, uh, if you like the episode and you feel like leaving us an honest review wherever you get your podcasts, that means the world to me. I really do appreciate it. Also, remember that uh, we are now on YouTube. So if you like watching podcasts, uh, watching the conversation, check us out there. Anyway, gang, take care of yourselves. Be well. Talk to you later. Bye.